Oh, it's so good to see you. It is such a joy to see people embracing one another and loving one another. We are truly a family, and uh, even though I live in a different part of the country, I always feel like family when I come here. It's so good to, so good to be here. So we're going to do um, something a little different today. We're going to jump into the book of Genesis. If you want to turn there, uh, we're going to start in chapter 29. So I've been doing a lot of study about the life of Jacob. And man, if you, if you read about Jacob, that man was a little messed up. Um, just some really interesting things that have gone on in his life. And, and it's interesting because um, as we've been th- going through this as I've been going through this study of Jacob, I've realized that this is much like a soap opera. Um, it's like, what could we name this soap opera? So I came up with one. As the Torah turns. So the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, if you're wondering what the Torah is. But it's an interesting thing because right from the beginning, we learn that God blesses humanity. And then we see man faltering. And then man desperately looking for reconciliation. And I say as the Torah turns because it's a similar story throughout the Torah. And maybe for many of our lives, (laughs) we are blessed by God. We falter and we desire reconciliation and redemption. The very first words God spoke to mankind in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 were words of blessing. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Very first word God spoke to mankind. The question is, what is a blessing? Jeff S. Anderson defined it this way. A blessing is, at its core, an enhancement of a life of fullness. So God, he blessed us by giving us a life of fullness, of completeness, of wholeness. And I, I love that this was God's original intent. As we, as we look at God's desire for all of us, is that we would have a life of blessing. Um, and he says right there in verse 28 that the blessing is found in the bonds of the family. Be fruitful and multiply. And w- so we see that that's there, but it's also that blessing extends to God's divine plan for all of mankind and that was to subdue the earth. Now, that word subdue is a really interesting word because it's a military term that means to take by control or to bring under control. And so did God, did he he, uh, create us to, to take control of the world in the sense of an army? No, not at all. In fact, this is why God created us in his image and likeness. Imago Dei. My um, Dr. Gary Brashears defines Imago Dei this way. Imago Dei is the amazing ability and awesome responsibility to make visible the invisible attributes of our creator and redeemer. So God created you and he created me in his image and in his likeness. He's given us these, this amazing ability this amazing ability and responsibility to make his attributes visible to the world. And by making his attributes visible to the world, we would subdue the world for his glory and for the good of mankind. That was God's original intent for mankind. However, as the Torah turns, continues, the divine plan was disrupted when Satan deceived Adam and Eve leading to sin and a departure from God's image to mankind desiring to live in their own image. Man still has this deep desire. Mankind still has this deep desire to take control of things, but in their own power and not in God's power. And I think probably if you're a human being, we all wrestle with that. We all like to control things. And um, I was once called a control freak. And at first, I'm like, I'm not a control freak, and I'll tell you why. And I tried to take control of that situation. Um, And so it's in us to do that. So God created mankind with these, these unique abilities to subdue the world. He infused into us the ability to create and to communicate and to connect with God himself and with one another. 
He spoke blessings to his beloved man, and then mankind was deceived and started not speaking blessings to one another. Adam started blaming Eve, and Eve started blaming the serpent, and that's when the blame game began. And that blame game continues on in many of our lives today. (laughs) But what's interesting is that pattern has repeated itself through the Torah and through time today. We saw it with Abraham and Sarah. We saw it with Isaac and Rebekah. And today we're going to look at the lives of Jacob as he's married to two wives, Leah and Rachel. And um, this episode of As the Torah Turns is titled Baby Wars. We're entering into baby wars. So now before we read these passages, I want to point out something that's so important that amid the baby wars, amid this competition, we see God's compassion and divine intervention through it all. And I think that's important. I'll bring that up a few different times. But what we're going to see is that God sees, God remembers. So let's see how God sees. Let's read verses 31 through 35 of Genesis chapter 29. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, excuse me, and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Father, we're thankful for the word of God, and we pray now, Lord, that the work of the Holy Spirit would open our hearts to a greater understanding of how we can learn lessons from um, this messed up family, Lord, and um, experience your blessing, even in the midst of our struggles. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I read these five verses, you can't help to see God's compassion on Leah is so beautiful. You see, Leah, she was truly the innocent party in this. If you go back and do the history um, of when um, Jacob fell in love with Rachel, but then Laban, uh, her father, set Jacob up and deceived him. He ended up marrying Leah, which apparently Leah wasn't good looking, and Rachel was really good looking, and we see that uh, he truly did love Rachel but we see this, this, this life in this home as just being miserable because Jacob hated her, but God loved her. He saw her longing. I just love that. When we, when we think about our relationships, even today, as, as maybe we're longing for a relationship with a husband or a wife or a family member or even a church member or whatever it may be, God sees it. He sees it. And the Lord of heaven and earth saw Leah was hated and blessed her by opening her womb, bearing four boys in succession. She had to have been thrilled. As a matter of fact, as you go through reading um, their names, you see the progression of how God was ministering to her. But what I want to point out before we talk about that is that God was good to Leah, even when her husband wasn't. Now, this, this is such a big thing. I've been married for 46 years, and I know that I've not always been the best husband. You know, and there's sometimes I'm like, oh, man, you know, I just didn't love her. But as my wife cried out, did the Lord meet her? Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Husbands are responsible to care for their wives, yet when they do not, God can meet the needs of a hurting wife, needs that may be neglected by the husband. I love this verse because who we are the bride of Christ, each and every one of us. So when our 
our earthly husbands or our earthly spouses or our earthly children or whatever it may be are neglecting us or making us feel lonely, we have a heavenly father through his son Jesus in which we'll come and to meet our needs. And so this is how God has been always. So as I said, Leah's emotions are evident in the names that she chooses for her children. Reuben means behold a son. She had to have been so excited, like behold a son. Now remember that the blessing comes in fulfilling the earth, right? Be fruitful and multiply. And Leah's like, I am fruitful and multiplying. She had to be so excited with that first son. And then it says, um, Simeon, his name means hearing because the Lord heard that she was unloved. Levi means attachment reflecting her hope that Jacob would love her. But her fourth son, Judah, his name means praise. And I love this. If there's one, okay, if there's only one example to follow in these two chapters <laughs> we're going to be looking at of somebody to follow, and that is Leah right here praising God. She's praising God for what he has done. It's so beautiful to see how God sees and responds to Le Leah's lonely heart. Blessing her even when her husband hated her. But more importantly, despite her struggles, Leah plays a pivotal role in God's plan. Being the mother of Judah from whom the Messiah would come. Isn't that amazing? Here she was this imperfect person, this lonely person, the one that felt neglected, but God used her in a great way. As Leah was praising God, it seems that Rachel had to have been standing around watching all these babies be born, and she got a little envious. Let's look in chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. When Rachel saw that she had bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Whew, that is, that's a soap opera line if I've ever heard one. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Can you feel the tension in the room? Oh, my goodness. Then she said, Here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her, so she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her, her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Whoa, as the Torah turns, it's heating up in the living room of their home. <laughs> Jacob comes home from a hard day's work. He gets in his lazy boy and he cracks open a cold one and here comes Rachel coming in. Give me children or I'll die. I just love that because maybe there's been some of that stuff in our house over the years and my response has always been in anger. Oh, who am I in the place of God? <laughs> you know, and you can feel the tension in the home. But as you start looking at this, we see that Le Leah and Rachel longed for what the other had. Not only was this a baby war, this competition, but there was a longing for what the other had. Leah wanted Rachel's beauty and Jacob's love. And Rachel wanted Leah's sons. So what does Rachel do? She takes control of the situation. She takes control of the situation and she, she sends in her maid in order to be a wife, in order to bear women. Does this story sound vaguely familiar to anyone? Isn't this exactly what Sarah and Abraham did with Hagar? As the Torah turns around and around, Rachel and Leah were comparing each other. They were comparing themselves to the other. The problem with comparison is that it only leads to two ends, one to shame or one to pride. And through this whole chapter, through this whole life, it's shame or pride, shame or pride. They're wrestling with one another. 
and the tension gets tighter and tighter. The names of these sons reflected Rachel's bitter struggle. Dan means God has vindicated me, and Naphtali means wrestle or struggle. I can almost see Rachel, after having these two babies through her, through her maid, walking out into the living room with her hands lifted high. I have prevailed, like she had won. And so the tension increases. The question I had as I was reading through this, what is Jacob doing? I mean, it, I kind of imagine just sitting back in his lazy boy chair going, man, look at this. I got two wives fighting over me, <laughs> and now they're giving me their maids. This is, this is good. And he just is silent. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't try to interject at any point. And so what we see here is that um, Leah is watching all that that's going on, and now she's going in for a reversal. Look at in verses 9 through 13. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to J Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah, or Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah had bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy so she called his name asher again leah's names names her two children bears the emotion in which she's experiencing gad means good fortune asher means happy she's saying good fortune and happiness but is she because where she went was from a place of praising god the creator and redeemer to looking for the praise of people all the daughters will be blessed by me. Look what I've done. And this is what's happening in this competition between them. Son, sadly, this ungodly competition took Leah's eyes off the Lord and put her put him on others. This is what competi or competition and envy does. Whenever we're trying to compete with one another, this is what happens. And this is why the New Testament of, uh, um, often tells us, hey, if we're going to compare ourselves to people, let's compare ourselves to Christ, the author and maker of all things, that we would keep our focus on him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So now we see Rachel's response in verses 14 through 21. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went out and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Leah said, excuse me, then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you also take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come into me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore a Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have I, I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have bore him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. So I've read those passages numerous times, and every time I read them, I'm asking, what on earth is a mandrake? <laughs> that word is so used so often. What is a mandrake? And it's interesting because it's a Hebrew word um, that describes a, a root that is known as the love apple. And so in that day, in that time, they thought it would to add in, increased fertility to uh, the woman. And so these mandrakes were sought to be something really special. Um, I have to say, was it a placebo? I don't know what it was. I don't know what the mandrakes were, but 
there's no doubt that God is the one that opens up the womb. <laughs> I'm just saying. But because Leah had these mandrakes, she knows that Jacob would sleep with her and have relationships with her, believing that there would be a greater likelihood to become pregnant. Again, remember, being fruitful and multiplying, most important thing to the Jewish family. And so she's like, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm having more and more babies. These mandrakes revealed that there was still hostility between Leah and Rachel. Imagine what it must have been like in the home. You took my husband, now you want my mandrakes? I mean, the tension had to be so intense. Couple quick lessons that we can learn here. When we take control of a situation and we go outside God's original plan, things are going to be miserable. God's original plan was not that man would have multiple wives. God's original plan is that one man, one woman would become one flesh. And so what we see is they stepped outside of what God's original plan was, and things were miserable. There was tension in the home. The second thing, and it's almost like the writers of Leviticus were reading about this story when they, in Leviticus 18.18 18, when it says it is forbidden for man to marry sisters. It's almost they're looking back, yeah, that, that didn't work out so great. Let's not do that again. So we see this, this area of happening of like, we need to set things straight. We need to put them in order. We need to stop taking control of things in our own power and look into God's power. It's no surprise to me that this family from Abraham on down the line struggled. They wrestled in life because children reflect the atmosphere of the home. They're learning the things that are happening in the home, and they're carrying those traditions on. Um, we were up in um, Crescent City, where my wife's from not long ago, and uh, talking to her cousin, who met a girl in high school at 17. She got pregnant. They had a baby. They're still married today. It's a great family. But their children, um, at 17... Mid in high school, they had a baby, and their grandkids just did it again. <laughs> it was like, man, do you not learn that maybe, <laughs> you know, but it's just one of those things, unless something comes and breaks it off. So Leah calls his name Issachar, meaning reward. Leah saw that the son uh, was a reward from God. Then Leah bore Jacob a sixth son, and named it, his name was Zebulun, and his name means dwelling. So in the pain of her heart, she's still waiting for her husband to love her, to care for her. And she hoped the quantity of sons that she would have would spark him to love her. So it's amid this ungodly competition that God saw and he responded to Leah's pain and affliction with compassion and blessing. I just love this. This is God's character. This is his attributes of showing that beautiful love and compassion even when things are amiss. The last few verses, 22 through 24, so we've seen that God sees and he responds, but now we see that he, God remembers and he hears. Look in verses 22 through 24. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. This is so beautiful to me. Here Rachel was wrestling with God. She's wrestling with Jacob. She's wrestling with Leah. She's basically a miserable, miserable person. But God still answers her prayer. God hears or God remembers and he hears our prayers and she gives name to jo uh, birth to Joseph Joseph's name has a double meaning which is really interesting um, God has taken away my reproach is one meaning but the other is add another son why that's interesting is apparently the baby wars is not over the competition is still going on, and Rachel's wanting another son. And uh, sure enough, by the time we get to chapter 35, don't worry, we're not going to chapter 35 today, <laughs> Benjamin is, is born. So we see that God answers or remembers and hears. So 
as we're going through this story, this episode of the baby wars as the Torah turns, you can often come back to this place and ask, God, are you in control? You know, as you read these stories, it's like, no, man just takes control and does what he wants to do, and they're just going to live miserably, and God's plan is being thwarted. But it's not. Is God truly in control? Uh, In his book, Chosen But Free, Norman Geisler wrote this. A God who is before all things, beyond all things, creates all things, upholds all things, knows all things, and can do all things, is also in control of all things. This complete control is called the sovereignty of God. As the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. Nothing catches God by surprise. All things come to pass as he ordained them from all eternity. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That word together in Romans 8, 20 is where we get our English word synergy. So what, what Paul is writing there is like, hey, all the good things, all the bad things, all those ugly things that's happening in your life, those are working out better for God's glory and for your good. Maybe not Uh, not immediate good, but eternal and ultimate good is what he's saying. And so he's, he's saying, hey, so lean into the Lord. When things are miserable in your home, when you're trying to take control of things and things are not going well, lean into the Lord. Why? Because it is God who opens and closes the womb. It is God who gives life. It is God who is control of our story and this story what is the consequence or what is the outcome of this story god was using this to shape what would become known as the 12 tribes of israel isn't that crazy using these flawed people to accomplish his perfect will for the 12 tribes of israel so the question is because we can't leave it here the question is this what can we do differently what could have jacob and rachel and leah done to experience god's blessing in the midst of all this how could they have behaved differently as i was putting the study together i was reminded of a couple that i met in israel back in 1992 and they were a true oh they were a true leah and jacob i mean she was such a sweet lady um but controlling and he was i don't even think he was a believer i'm quite certain he wasn't a believer wasn't a believer but it was almost like one day she said we're going to israel and he says i don't want to go to israel and she said you're going to israel (laughs) and so they ended up in israel and being around them was not nice it all the tension oh it was horrible about three years later I run into them at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. We're walking through the quad, and there they are. But things look different. I mean, she still looked like her sweet self, but he had this joy on his face. And I'm like, what? What's going on here? So I went up to him, and I'm like, man, you you guys look so happy. Thinking back in my mind, what happened to you, dude? (laughs) And this is what he said to me. My wife continued to pray for me and praise the Lord despite our struggles. One day, I asked her how she did it, and she replied, I asked the Holy Spirit for the power to deal with you every day. (laughs) And he was faithful to give me that power. He got born again. And it was such a beautiful thing. As I was thinking about that story, I was reminded of what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, if you want to turn there. Ephesians 5. 5 verses 18 through 21 because in these few verses there's three things that I want to leave you with today to really consider of how we can experience God's blessing even when our situation is miserable Paul writing to the Ephesians in verse 18 of chapter 5 says look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of our 
of, your, of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be, get drunk on wine or with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody, melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of the reverence of Christ. So there's three things that we're going to pull out here. But before we pull those out, I need to point out that Jacob, Leah, and Rachel walked unwisely. They walked foolishly. They didn't understand what the will of the Lord was. And so they never inquired of the Lord. And so Paul is saying, do not be drunk on wine. He's saying, do not, do not take care of your problems the way the world does. Because that's going to lead you to doing things that you would not normally do, like debauchery. You know, that wouldn't be the normal thing unless you're drunk. He's like, no, rather, first thing, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled means to make full or to fill. The word is used to fill a vessel or a hollow place. And the grammar, the tense that this is, is it's the imperfect tense, which means that we are to continually, continually or constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. So as I was thinking about what vessel needs to be emptied of self, needs to be emptied of things that would be hindering it from being filled, and I thought of the human heart. The human heart is filled with self-desire. The human heart is filled with self-control. It's, it's in us. That's the human part of us. So in a sense, Paul is saying, get rid of that. Empty yourself of yourself that the Holy Spirit may have be able to fill you. And I just love that picture. Had Leah and Rachel, Leah and Rachel's envy would have been mitigated by being filled with the Holy Spirit leading them to exhibit patience and kindness rather than jealousy and competition. So emptying yourself of self, giving room to, for the Holy Spirit to fill. The second thing is singing songs of praise. Uh, the word praise is syn synonymous with the word thanksgiving that we just read. Being thankful for all things, you know, always being thankful. As a matter of fact, the words praise the Lord the phrase, praise the Lord, is used 250 times in the Bible. Um, you know, if God says something one time, we should probably listen. What, what should we do if he said is it 250 times, <laughs> right? We should really pay attention to what that is. And um, the 250 times that it's used, it's always people being touched by God's mercy and goodness, thanking him for what he's done amidst their wrestlings and struggles. Praise the Lord. It's the kind of praise that empties the heart of self and fills it um, and, and blesses the heart of God and blesses the heart of others. The third and, you know, had Jacob been praising God, I was thinking, remember I talked about how Jacob was just sitting back watching the, the women wrestle over him. Had he been praising God, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual song, making a melody in his heart, in his home, there wouldn't have been the havoc in the home. There would have been harmony in the home. And so as, as we think about things that we should do, um, we should come to that place of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The third and last thing is submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Nobody actually likes the word submit. It's like, oh, that's a five-letter word. Like, that's a bad word. But it's actually a great word. It simply means to place yourself under the control of another. Do you know who did that perfectly? Jesus. I mean, when you read through the Gospels, Jesus did nothing without inquiring of the Father first. He was fully submitted to the Father, fully submitted to everything that he would do and pray and, and ask for God's guidance. So what Paul is saying here is that, hey, you should be fully submitted not only out of the reverence, out of fear of the Lord, but also to one another. How do we do that? 
Well, we invite Jesus into our relationship. We say, okay, Jesus, I'm having tension. These problems are happening. I want to invite you in to, um, into this relationship. It's really interesting because in, in chapter 5, verse 21 of Ephesians, it's like a hinge. We talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about singing songs and praises and then submitting to one another. And then it opens the door into what follows it. And what follows it? Marriages, children, and the workplace. You know why that's so interesting? If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, after the con- the, and look at the consequences of the fall, it's with marriages, children, and the workplace. So here's the reality. Satan wants to derail you and me, just like he did Adam and Eve, by hitting us hard when it comes to the family. I remember... Uh, When my wife and I first started going to church, um, we were in our early 30s, you know, and had a six-year-old son. And, man, we would would get the kid packed up, you know, and get in the car. And on the way to church, inevitably, we'd get in in an argument, sometimes just a knock-down, drag-out fight. I could not tell you one thing we fought about, but it just seemed like yelling and screaming and my poor son listening to everything that we're saying and oh yeah and then one day it hit me like why do we always fight on our way to church probably none of you do that but then it hit me like satan doesn't want us to go to church feeling holy and ready to receive the lord he wants to destroy it and devour it so we put a plan together immediately we're like okay this is what we're going to do we are going to drive separately (laughs) we didn't actually do that (laughs) but the idea is like okay no let's not drive separately let's invite jesus into the conversation and so we intentionally and we still do this all these years later like we do not talk about anything outside of the Lord on the way to church. It's just like, let's just, let's just what's Jesus going to say today? How is he going to speak to us? And inviting men in intentionally, because this is where Satan wants to derail you. When you think about in the church, the divorce rate is equal to what it is in the, in the world. We know that there's a huge problem here because we're not understanding what that looks like. So that verse 21, years ago, I was asked to come and, and share here, and I it's right after I'd written a book. Um, and gosh, I think Dan was still here when that happened. I can't remember how long ago that was, 2015, 2016. But the book was called Contented in All Things Peace. And the, the key verse in that whole book is Ephesians 5.21. Because this is what it meant to me. We went through, when I wrote that book, we went through some really difficult things in our church. Um, really difficult things. Big church split. I mean, it was, it was horrible. And I'm like, Lord, how, how can I deal with this? How can I have the power to deal with this? And the Lord gave me this verse because verse 21 to me is a perfect picture of communion. Now, when I say communion, you might be thinking, oh, you mean drinking the wine and breaking the bread? Yes, but so much more. So that word, kinonia, is used 20 times in the New Testament. Four times it's talking about breaking bread and drinking wine. The rest of the time, it's talking about fellowship and partnership and sharing one another's, um, from one another's funds or whatever it may be, giving. And so when you think about communion, all it is, it's, it's inviting a third person into the conversation. It's just saying, Jesus, I need you to help me. I need you to guide me and direct me. And so um, when I started thinking about what does that communion look like? Well, I put together a rhythm for me, and now you can use this if you want, or you can come up with your own type of thing that helps you bring, helps bring you into a place of communion. But at that time, I'm an early riser, always have been. I don't necessarily like it, but I do get up very early. Um, and I refuse to let my feet touch the ground until 5 a.m. I'm going to, oh, if I get up at 3, that means two hours laying in bed. <laughs> I'm not getting up um, because I don't have permission to have coffee until five. But um, I'll lay in bed and I'll just, Lord, 
I think of what 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins, he's just and righteous to, and faithful to forgive me of all unrighteousness. And so I'll just say, Lord, forgive me for the sins of yesterday, my, my selfish behavior, whatever it may be, just Lord, confessing, emptying my heart. And then I'll start singing songs and hymns and spiritual song, making a melody in my heart. I, I need to say in my heart, because if you heard me sing, you'd like your wife still <laughs> lives with you. <laughs> if you're singing verbally, no, I am not singing, but in my heart. And then by the time five o'clock comes around, I'm ready. I'm five o'clock, I get up, make my coffee. I open up the word. I'm inviting Jesus in to speak to me. Lord, how... Help me with my relationships today. And it's always relationships. Why? That's why we're here. That's why we're on earth, right? We're to make visible the invisible attributes of our creator and redeemer to, the wor to not only to those around us, but to the world around us. And so I know that Satan's going to want to ruin my relationships. So to always keep them at that forefront. And so... That's my rhythm. Um, if you want it, I can write it down for you. It's $500. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but come up with something that is bringing you into that place of communion. Um, because if you're a human being, you're struggling in relationships. If you're not human, then I want to talk to you after. <laughs> can I pray for you? Father, we're so thankful we are so thankful, Lord, for just as we are sharing, Lord, that you've given us this beautiful opportunity to confess our sins, to empty our hearts of selfishness. And I pray for this body, this wonderful body of believers, Lord, that even right now as we're sitting here, Lord, that we would just empty ourselves of ourselves, knowing that this doesn't only bless you, but it blesses those around us. Lord, we thank you that we have the gospel. We have the word of God that reveals to us all that you've done for us. Not only through your son, Jesus, but that you continue to do by giving us through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray your blessing upon each and every one of us, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing of your spirit today. God, that we would submit to one another in the reverence of Christ that our relationships would not only make an impact on ourselves, but on everyone around us, that the world would see that there is hope. And um, we're just so thankful that you've chosen us uh, to represent you, to make visible those invisible attributes. In Jesus' name, amen.